Well, good morning. morning. It's good to see all of you here this morning, and welcome here to First Presbyterian Church for our worship time together. And it's a good day to be here as we gather to offer our prayers and hear the word read and proclaimed and to sing our hymns of joy and thanksgiving. It's a good day to be together. We have a number of announcements this morning. The first is, if you will look in your pews in the... um, I don't know what that's called, the little receptacle things where the hymns usually go or the Bibles are. There's a little piece of paper and it says, what is your favorite hymn? Do you see that? Is it in the, yes, yes, yes. Now, what we would like for you to do, please, if you are so inclined, is to write a couple, one, two, or three of your favorite hymns on that piece of paper, and then when you leave today, if you could just put it in the offering plate by the door, and we're going to collect those, and next Sunday, we are going to have a modified hymn sing. We're going to pick some of the, what seem to be the favorite hymns, and we will include them, as many as possible, in our service next Sunday. So if you have one that you're just wanting so very badly to sing, I'm not going to tell you not to write it down 20 times and put it in the plate. But just that's what we're doing. And we would appreciate your help so we make sure that we we are choosing uh, everyone's favorite. Also, next Sunday, we are planning a retirement reception for Karen Dallas. She has been our office manager for about 16 years, and she is retiring. And between the services and fellowship hour next Sunday, we will have a reception for her. And so we would invite everyone to please stay, bring your cards, consider giving a love offering, and just celebrate all that she She has meant to us as a church over the last 16 years and, of course, to offer her our blessings as she moves into the next stage of her life. Then, the following Sunday, June 5th, you might have seen some of the slides on the uh, screens up above. We are going to be collecting the Pentecost offering. June 5th happens to be Pentecost, and it is the day that we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit to the church. Everyone wears red. It's a wonderful, glorious day. And on that Sunday, we have one of our denominational offerings, and that is the Pentecost offering. And the monies we collect for that particular offering goes to support through the denomination, the programs and ministries that are specifically for children, young adults, and youth. So things like the, the Triennium, the big youth conferences, uh, some of the subsequent conferences uh, supporting uh, the, the ministries on the national level that we develop to help uh, with targeting and and reaching out to young people. It goes to ha- support our volunteers in mission, the program for young adults who take uh, anywhere from six months to two years and volunteer their time in uh, service for the church. So it's a very important offering for the life of the church. In addition to that, so we'll, we'll collect that offering, but they also, 40%, of what we collect, the denomination says keep that in your local community and give it to a ministry that supports children at risk. And so our session has decided that we will give that, oh, I'm going to have this wrong, um, it's the backpack program where we put the, the food, give the food to the children over the weekend. Blessings, Blessings thank you. Uh, Blessings in a backpack kind of a thing. And so that's where uh, the 40% of what we collect will stay here and we will give it to that ministry. So please think about that on June 5th. 
This is in day, indeed a glorious day to be together. We know that where two or more of us are gathered in God's name, in Christ's name, we, we will know what the, that the Spirit is among us. And so let's prepare our hearts to worship God. It's way past midnight Everyone's asleep Outside the window It's quiet on the street My bags are packed My guitar too Taxi's coming Nothing I can do but oh Lord, keep your eye on my friends. I just feel better knowing you're watching them. I've got to roll, take a little spin. And while I'm gone, thank you. keep your eye on my friends. Gotta get home, only way I know The long old road, steady and slow One of these days I'll come back If the creek don't rise, stuff like that But oh Lord, keep your eye on this place Keep it warm or cool, and keep it safe you know I depend on your saving grace While I'm gone, keep your eye on this place This is a prayer like any other Nothing more, nothing less It's just a prayer like any other Just one more time could you just say yes? But oh Lord, keep your eye on me. You know how foolish and reckless I can be. Light up my way so I can see. Oh Lord, keep your eye on me. Oh Lord, keep your eye on my friends. Oh Lord. Keep your eye on this place. Thank you. Please join me in the responsive call to worship. God's goodness is breaking into the world. God gathers in those we judged to be outsiders. And let's pray. Creator God, you drew out life-giving water from a desert rock. We give you thanks for the water of baptism. In being joined with Christ, we die to what destroys and are raised to new life with Christ. As streams rush into rivers, may our lives flow into yours, joining your creative work for a world in need. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I invite you to stand with me as we sing our opening hymn, Blessed Jesus at Your Word. Blessed Jesus, at your word, we have come again to hear you. Let our thoughts and hearts be stirred, and in glowing faith be near you. By your gospel, true and holy, 
teach us, Lord, to love you solely. All our knowledge, sense, and sight lie in deepest darkness shrouded. Till your spirit breaks our night, filling us with light unclouded. All your thoughts and all good living come by but your gracious giving. Glorious Lord, yourself impart light of light from God proceeding. Touch our lips and ears and heart. Help us by your Spirit's pleading. Hear the cry your cheer now reaches. Hear and bless our prayers and praises. We are a people living in sin. We are a people in need of God's vision, praying for our eyes to be opened. We are a people in need of God's reversal, praying for our hearts to be softened. We are a people in need of God's reconciliation, praying that our faces might be illumined by God's presence. So let us claim our need of God and confess our sin together. Let's pray. Gracious God, we equate our judgment with your judgment and often consider our ways to be your ways. We define peace as the absence of disruption, holding our comfort as your aim and thinking our preferences reflect your way. Too often we act as if we are your authoritative witnesses, believing our worldview corresponds with your vision and that our narrative contains your hope for the future. O oh God, dislodge us from our sinful assumptions, forgive our selfish ways, correct us with your truth, and teach us by your spirit. And let's pause for a time of silent personal confession. And let all God's children say, Amen. It is the Lord who opens eyes to see. It is the Lord who softens hearts to hear. It is the Lord who returns us to God's presence. Peace, peace, and peace. You are loved. You are enough. You belong. In Jesus Christ, you are restored. Thanks be to God forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia, give thanks to the risen Lord. Alleluia, alleluia, give praise to his name. Please be seated. And I'll invite the children to join me up here for a moment. Good morning. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. You can keep it. Sure. Wherever. How about sit right, you sit right here. Is that okay? All right. Okay, so how many of you have friends? How, do you guys have friends? I have friends too. Oh, that's great. I hope it works out. Well, um, so when you meet new friends, it's pretty exciting, isn't it? Because you get to meet a new person and they might like to like play with the same things you like to play and then you laugh at the same kind of things that you laugh at and you get to have a good time, right? Well, there's a story in the Bible and we're going to read it this morning. It's about a man named Paul who makes a new friend 
who's named Lydia. And they just happen, Paul, Lydia's down at the river, just kind of doing her thing with some other people. And Paul comes along and he meets Lydia and they realize they have a lot in common. And Lydia's got some friends because Paul's kind of new to town. He hasn't been there very long. He doesn't have any friends in town. And so Lydia does a really nice thing. She says, you know what? Why don't you come to my house and I'll introduce you to a bunch of other people too. And it ended up that Paul made really good friends there in that town called Philippi. And um, he stayed there for a little while. And I think the, there's a lot of things in that story. But the part of it that I like best is that Paul and Lydia became friends. That they um, invited each other, they talked to each other, they, uh, Lydia invited Paul, and he got to know a lot of really nice people. And it just reminds us how important it is for us to meet new people and to be nice and to uh, pay attention to them. And if we think they're lonely or uh, don't have any friends, that we can be their friends too. And so we just introduce ourselves and we can become their friends and then they don't have to be lonely anymore. So I'm grateful for my friends and I think it'd be good if we ask, if we tell God thank you for all of our friends. What do you think? So I'm going to say a few words. I'm going to pray and say some words, and then you can say them after me. How about that? All right, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for our friends. And thank you uh, for new people we meet. And uh, thank you for our friends here at church. Amen. And you may go back to your seats. I have the, you're good. Do you want one? Okay. Thank you. As we come to this time of prayer, when we consider our prayers for ourselves and for other people, I know that many of us are still uh, concerned about the violence that just seems to be pervasive and uh, in our society. And we still have heavy hearts and concerns for those who were impacted by the mass shootings that just seem to continue to unfold. Today in particular, um, I would ask that we keep in mind the keep and, and offer prayers for the Irvine Taiwanese Presbyterian congregation that was um, suffered such violence last week, as well as the Geneva Presbyterian Church, that is their sister church. They meet in the same building together as they are um, just reeling from that act of violence. And then also, of course, the people involved in the Buffalo supermarket shooting and just the list can go on and on and on. And so we lift them up in prayer. Then also this morning, our sister church over in Crystal River, the Tree of Life Presbyterian Church, they have actually had to suspend worship and all of their meetings until the first Sunday of June because COVID is just doing a number on their congregation. And so they have decided not to meet for a couple of weeks and hopefully it will uh, die down. But um, we keep them in our prayers and the many in their, that church. And then we do have a few in our own who are currently very sick with COVID. So um, we just keep them and many others in our prayers. As we bow our heads and um, I invite you to a time of silent prayer. When I lead us, when you hear me say, God of new life, hear our I invite you to respond, hear our prayer. Let's pray.
rejoicing in your great promise of new creation, O God. We pray to you because you are the maker of heaven and earth. And so we pray for the church. Open our hearts to your word of life so that we may eagerly receive your truth and devote our lives to your service. We pray for our sister churches that are suffering due to acts of violence or due to the impact of COVID. We pray, O oh gracious God, that we can be a place of grace and minister in your name. O oh God of new life, hear our prayer. We pray for the world. Be gracious and bless the earth. Let your rule of equity and justice prevail among all the nations. God of new life, hear our prayer. We pray for this community. Be the Lord and light of this city. Grant its gates to all who need shelter. Open its great gates to all who need shelter. And let this place become a temple of peace. God of new life, hear our prayer. We pray for loved ones. Stir up a sense of compassion in us. Speak your word of grace and healing to all who want to be made well. God of new life, hear our prayer. Gracious God, keep us working and praying for the coming of your holy realm of peace when we will share abundant life with you. We pray all of these things through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Is my soul at rest? In him comes my salvation. He only is my rock, my strength, and my salvation. My stronghold, my savior. I shall not be afraid at all, my stronghold, my Savior. I shall not be moved. Only in God is found safety when an enemy pursues me. Only in God is found holy. I am found weak and found lowly. My stronghold, my Savior, I shall not be afraid at all. My stronghold, my Savior, I shall not be moved. Only in God is my soul at rest. In him comes my salvation. And let's pray. Gracious God, living word, as you revealed yourself to Mary that Easter morning, so reveal yourself to us. By the power of your spirit, give each of us faith that hearing your word, we too may proclaim, I have seen the Lord. Amen. Our first reading today comes from Revelation chapter 21, verse 10, and then 22 
through chapter 22, verse 5. I know you've all followed along with that, but it will be on the screen. And in the spirit, he carried me away to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory to it. Its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. People will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations. But nothing unclean will enter it, nor anyone who practices abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the day. On either side of the river is the tree of life and its twelve kinds of fruit, producing each fruit from each, each its fruit each month, and the leaves of the live are and the and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Nothing accursed will be found there any more. But the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. And there will be no more night. They will need no lamp of or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Our gospel reading today day comes from John chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. After this, there was a festival of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there is a pool called, in Hebrew, Beth Zatha which has five porticos. In these lay many invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him laying there and knew that he had been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, stand up, take your mat, and walk. At once the man was made well, and he took up his mat and began to walk. Now that day was a Sabbath. And finally, our second New Testament reading outside of the Gospels comes from Acts chapter 16, verses 9 through 15. Now, this is the story of when Paul meets Lydia outside of the city of Philippi. He goes down to a river and meets her. And I had the privilege a few years ago to go to Philippi with my friend who recently passed away. Um, and she and I loved it. Lyd Lydia is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. And the city is just of uh, Philippi is just ruins now. It's in a place where it's prone to earthquakes. And so after having to rebuild the city a number of times, they finally just gave up. And it's still, so it's ruins. Except as we do, um, the church at some point made a shrine where we can mark this great meeting between Paul and Lydia. And so this is known as the Baptistry of St. Lydia, and it's a building, this beautiful little building on the side of the river, and inside it looks like this, and that's basically it. There's a big baptismal font in the middle, and it's just gorgeous. It's just absolutely beautiful, and it's, it's one of those places that it just... You want to be silent, but you almost can't because even if you whisper, there's so much stone that it just carries and echoes. But it's just absolutely beautiful. But outside by the river, they've made this. And Philippi is up, kind of up in the foothills. It's, uh, it's in the hills. And so this river is the river that comes out of the city of Philippi. This is where they would have... Uh, gotten their water for everything that would have fed the city. And so they have 
made this kind of amphitheater around it just in this one little spot so that you can have a worship service or you can have a meet, you, people can meet there. They also have little steps down to the river where you can sit and put your feet in. And it's just, it's just absolutely beautiful. It's in the trees, it's in the mountains, it's a cool breeze. And then further along past it, this is just kind of what the river is like. So it's not a big rushing river. And, and I know that when Philippi was a big bustling city, the river, uh, the down river was probably not this pristine, but <laughs> it just gives you an idea that this is, this is the river and of where Lydia and Paul were meeting. So, you can use your imaginations. During the night, Paul had a vision. There stood a man of Macedonia, pleading with him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, he immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called him us to proclaim the good news to them. We set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace, the following day to Neapolis, and there to Philippi, which is a leading city in the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you had judged me to be unfaithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For those of you who don't know, a few weeks ago, one of my dearest friends passed away. Her name was Jean Vernon. She's the woman I went on the trip to Philippi with. And she was 92. She was 92, but she was not a typical 92-year-old. She was still serving on the session at her church. She was serving on the Presbytery Council. And she was working on a task force to help three small Presbyterian congregations in her area join together so they could thrive together rather than struggle separately. She died in the fellowship hall at the First Presbyterian Church in Brunswick, Georgia, at a Linton Wednesday night supper. She was sitting at one of the tables having a discussion about the future of those three congregations, and the pastor had directed the people who were sitting at the tables to pair up and discuss a few questions. When the pastor tried to pull everyone back into the larger group, Jean kept talking, which was not uncommon. She kept talking to her partner and talking and talking and discussing, even as the, the pastor was really making it obvious that the time for discussion was over. There were giggles that were starting around the room, and then finally Jean said to the pastor, okay, Janice, we can move on now. There was a lot of laughter and eye-rolling because that was Jean. It was only a few moments later that she got dizzy and passed away right there in the fellowship hall, surrounded by people who loved her while she was doing what she loved to do. At her funeral, it was very remarkable. I was one of three pastors invited to participate in the service, and as I looked out over the congregation, I saw so many faces I knew, and many I did not. There was a whole section of the church filled with pastors and elders from across the presbytery, some of whom who had traveled for over three and a half hours to get there. Jean was a lifelong Girl Scout, and she still 
taught outdoor cooking at the local Girl Scout camp in the summertime. And there were representatives from the local and national levels there to honor her, as well as women who had once known her as their Girl Scout sponsor. There were her poker buddies, her golfing buddies, her Ivy League buddies. There were a young adults from around the presbytery who were there because they had known her as the ever faithful camp nurse at summer camp. And they had known her as the consummate Montreat Youth Conference adult sponsor. Every summer she would join with others as the adults who would take 35 to 40 youth to Montreat, North Carolina to the National Conference for Youth. She retired from that job at 90. I met Jean because she was a member of the church where I was an associate pastor. She was very devoted to her husband, Marshall, who had been very ill for a number of years. And when he passed away, she came into my office and plopped down on an easy chair that was in there. And she just started talking. And it became a routine. Before or after meetings, she would just come in and plop down in my office. Then we started having lunch. Then when there were late meetings, she would just invite me up for a bite over at her house because I lived about 40 minutes away, 45 minutes away. When my husband Kirk died, Jean took me in. She let me stay at her home when I didn't want to go to my empty house. She would sit for hours on her porch with me, listening as I grieved and as I shared my misgivings, my struggles with my faith, my need to know how to go on. She sat and listened and offered wise, caring counsel. But most of all, and it was hard for many to believe, she would just sit and listen and not talk at all. She became one of my best friends and I, that, that I could ever imagine having. And we had some great adventures together in places like London and Oxford and Greece, Bulgaria and Turkey and Montreat and summer camp. She added so much to my life and to the lives of so many others from a wide variety of places and backgrounds. And I share this with you today because my experience of Jean is that she would simply decide that she was going to be friends with someone. She decided that she and I were going to be friends. And I don't know why. And I don't know exactly how it happened. But Jean simply decided we were going to be friends, and that was it. And I wasn't the only person she did that with. She was intentional about building relationships with people. Whether she was sitting next to a stranger in a restaurant waiting for a table, meeting a child at camp, welcoming a new member into the church, or a new pastor into the presbytery, wherever Jean went, she made an effort to meet people. And she was really good at striking up a conversation. She would just decide, I'm going to speak to this person or these people. And sometimes that conversation took place for simply a moment. And others lasted decades. The conversation would continue and a friendship would be built she modeled for many, sometimes intentionally and sometimes unintentionally, the sacred act of building connections. And truly, you'd never know where those conversations were going to take her or you or anyone else around her. Jean taught many the power of holy conversations, 
And that is a gift I think we so often neglect, but that we need to embrace and nurture. These days, there are so many hot-button topics we believe we should not discuss so that we end up limiting ourselves and the church as a whole from being as welcoming and as full as it could and really should be. We try to keep our conversations limited to people we know are our people rather than building relationships with God's diverse, and beautiful creations. To have a holy conversation, we've got to recognize a few things. First, we need to recognize that the Holy Spirit is part of who we are at all times. As followers of Christ, we have received the Holy Spirit and if we are willing to open ourselves up to the people around us, then we can let the Holy Spirit lead us in our relationships. If we're willing to open ourselves up simply to speak to someone, we make the glorious declaration and acknowledge that they are worthy. They are human beings created in God's image, just like I or you are. We tell them they are worthy of being known. And this is a gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of life and the affirmation of it. Second, we don't have holy conversations to change the other person. If anything, we have them to change ourselves. We learn the power of love and acceptance simply by meeting a variety of people. Last week, we saw this happen to Peter, who met Gentiles and saw the Holy Spirit at work in their lives. Peter never imagined that would be possible, but he opened himself up to the Holy Spirit, and he learned the worth of people outside of his limited circle, and it changed the church and ultimately made a place for us. When we meet a wide variety of people, the prejudices that limit us and limit the church are set aside because the doors are flung open for all of God's children to find welcome. Third, holy conversations are blatantly evangelistic. Sometimes. But not all the time. We know Jesus certainly practiced having holy conversations, but sometimes we think that whenever we meet some, someone new or, or we're under the pressure of saying, I need to have a holy conversation, that somehow by the end of it, we're going to have a new church member in tow. That's not a, what a holy conversation is about. Sometimes it may lead in that direction, an invitation to come to church. Sometimes it may lead to something else. When we see how Jesus had his holy conversations, we recognize that sometimes they happened at dinner time, as he walked with his disciples, as he sat on a hillside, as he was trying to escape the crowds. Sometimes he was at the temple or the synagogue. Sometimes he was simply sitting at a well waiting for somebody to bring him a drink of water. And sometimes it happened when he was walking past the healing pools in Jerusalem, like he did today. Jesus would talk to people. He would talk to people. And in our gospel lesson today, he asked a man if he wanted to be healed. And the man answered him. And Jesus made the man well. If Jesus had not taken the time to talk to the man who'd already waited for decades to be put into the healing waters, who knows if that man would have ever found the healing he was seeking. Holy conversations lead us in directions we cannot imagine and can often bring blessing with them. They can bring healing to ourselves and to others. 
They can bring hope or joy. It can make our world bigger and also smaller as we realize we are all connected in ways we don't imagine. Paul practiced the gift of holy conversations too. In our lesson today, he strikes up a conversation with the women at the river. Women! Not exactly usual for a Jewish man to do something like that as we understand. It wasn't customary. But he had gone to the river to seek out those who might be worshiping, might be having prayer, because in Philippi there probably wasn't a synagogue and he had gone to the river to find if there were some people that he could pray with. And that's where he meets Lydia. And they talk for a while. And the next thing you know, the Philippian church is born. Lydia uses her gifts to help establish the church and financially support the missionary efforts efforts going on all around her. All because she and Paul opened themselves up to a conversation. Jesus and Paul and Lydia were speaking to strangers they happened to meet. And it was beautiful what happened. Oftentimes these days, though, it seems that church folks don't often speak to others in the same congregation. We don't want to say anything we shouldn't. We find ourselves, our circle of friends, and... That's where we stay. We may also know that John or Jane has a different point of view than we do, so we don't talk to them for fear that we will start an argument. But then again, that's another thing about holy conversations. They are a reflection of the basic understanding that we are all children of God and loved by God equally. And so we hear each other We meet each other, we accept each other, and we love each other. We learn and live the principle that as the church, we are bound together by what we have in common, and that is Jesus Christ, rather than all the differences that we have between ourselves. Churches suffer today because we don't speak to the right people. Rather, we speak about them. We take the easy way out sometimes when it comes to disagreements or perceived disagreements or slights or whatever else, offense you want to call it. We hold each other accountable for what we think someone else is thinking rather than having a loving conversation and lovingly agreeing to disagree or lovingly realize that we were mistaken or lovingly realize that we have more in common than a disagreement about one issue, and so we're friends. Sometimes it seems we would rather cut off relationships and divide ourselves into little groups of like-minded individuals than do the hard work of conversing with one another and loving as Christ loved us. That's a terribly pain-filled way to live, and it weakens our witness. It hampers our ability to share the good news, and it makes it terribly difficult to welcome in new members and new believers. It's a way to keep the Holy Spirit at bay so we can be comfortable with the status quo rather than challenged by spiritual growth. Love gets lost, and we lose our true purpose, which is to follow as Christ as he leads us. At Jean's funeral, I happily got to see some of the former parishioners that I had known years ago, and it was a great joy to see them. One of them is named Frank, and he is also 92. At the reception, he gave me a great big hug and said with tears in his eyes, you know, Jean and I disagreed on a lot of things, and boy, did they. Believe me, they were both pig-headed, opinionated, and they could go at it. But, said Frank, and I had heard this sentiment 
echoed by Jean as well when she was alive. He said, we always respected each other and we didn't let that keep us from loving each other. I sure am gonna miss her. Frank testified in those few words the power of holy conversation, the power of the Holy Spirit to bind us together for the sake of building up the church, not for ourselves, but for the good news of Jesus Christ and the transformation of the world. Today and every day, I pray that we will always allow God's love to shine through who we are in our differences, in our similarities, in our witness, in our welcome, in our disagreements, in our vision and our purpose. And I pray we will have the courage to have holy conversations that bring life and love into the world and into our daily living. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for the gift of each other. Good old friends and strangers we have yet to meet. Help us to speak your words and with you love all with your love, always be present with others so that we will share in your healing, your greatness, and your community. Amen. Having heard the word read and proclaimed, I invite you to stand with me as we affirm our faith together. Once again, we are using a small portion of the Confession of 1967. Life in Christ is life eternal. The resurrection of Jesus is the sign that God will consummate the work of creation and reconciliation beyond death and bring to fulfillment the new life begun in Christ. Once again, we have come to the practice where we give our offerings at the back of the sanctuary or send them in directly to the church office. But we know that these Offerings are an act of worship, no matter how they are given. And so I invite you to pray with me as we dedicate our offerings today. Eternal God, take and use these gifts for your purpose in the world, giving food to the hungry, hope to the despairing, and new life to the dead. Teach us to live each day for you so that future generations will know your goodness and praise your glory. In the name of Christ our Lord, amen. Let's remain standing as we sing our closing hymn, Go to the World.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen.